since some of you I know are seeing me the, for the first time, I would like to spend about five or six minutes or, s- or seven minutes just bringing you up with a concise biography of how this artist came, came to be a pastor. I was born in northeastern Kentucky at a very beautiful place where the Appalachian Mountains cascade gently across the broad Ohio River Valley. I was born in the home of my father, uh, his father before him, and even my great-grandfather who only had one arm but could do the work of two men. I was sick when I was born. My bones were soft and would not receive calcium, and as a result, I couldn't stand up or sit up or walk until after I was uh, three years old. And uh, I was born into poverty. We lived in a three-room shack with a tar paper roof and had almost nothing that was store-bought. And we didn't have a car or, or uh, even electricity or running water. In fact, my, my father worked at Wamsley Sawmill, a sawmill, 16 hours a day for a dollar. And uh, he'd been there since he was 13 years old. So that was my beginning. But because of my sickness, every day after the end of the first eight-hour shift, My father would run home to see me. It was about two miles, and he would, instead of resting, and I know he needed to just sit down on a log and rest after working for eight hours, but instead he would run two miles to the top of the hill, a place called Slate Holler, and there he just wanted to spend time with me. Uh, Doc Isham said maybe I had muscular dystrophy or maybe it was polo, but the truth, polio, the truth was he didn't know. And, uh, but he was concerned if I would ever walk and I wore braces to hold my shoulders back until they wore blisters on my shoulders. And then dad cut the handle out of the broom and put that behind my elbows and I would sit like that as just a little boy propped up with pillows. But whenever the siren would go off in our town announcing that it was the end of the first shift, we could hear that up at the top of the hill and mom would surround me with pillows and face me toward the door so I could see my daddy when he came in. And he would always whistle everywhere he went, so I would hear him whistling first and then his big feet stomping around on the loose boards of the front porch trying to get rid of the sawdust, and he'd run his hands through his curly hair to knock out the sawdust, got a hold of the doorknob and rattled it for a long time to make sure he had my attention, and stepped through the door and scooped me up with giant shovel-like hands and put me in a homemade high chair and gobbled down his lunch. Then the fun began. He would sing songs, made up songs about me, played the banjo, the guitar, the harmonica, Uh, told stories about my grandpa who was a tap dancer in vaudeville, a bare knuckles boxer for money, a riverboat gambler, quite the character Snake Toll was. And he told those things and sang those songs. But one day, instead of doing everything that I'd love and learn to expect, dad left me in the high chair, went into our living room, which wasn't really a different room, but had different furniture and our only art, a calendar that showed a picture of Jesus walking on the water. Dad went and got the calendar and a piece of white cardboard and a pencil and sat down in front of me. And as I watched from my high chair, he began to draw that image of Jesus on the piece of cardboard. And as his hand swept over that paper, it became a thing of beauty before my eyes. Suddenly, Mom came over and said, Junior, it's time to go. And Dad jumped up and kissed me here on the forehead and ran out the door. Mom put the pencil and the paper and the calendar all away. And everyone forgot it but me. But that day, God touched my face with destiny. I didn't even know the word art or artist. I just knew I wanted to do that. I wanted to touch things with my hands and make them beautiful. That became my identity. When my bones were well and I went away to the first grade, there was a beautiful blonde haired lady there with bright blue eyes and a long skirt that swirled like this when she turned her right on the chalkboard and I went straight to the front of the room and said, my name is Mitchell. I'm an artist. If you need any pictures, check with me. And. Uh, Even though there were 35 noisy kids, uh, she didn't ignore me. She stopped what she was doing and motioned with her finger like this, inviting me to follow her to the oak desk that sat in the front of the room. And she got out a box of colored chalk and drew a rectangle down low on the chalkboard uh, where a little boy could reach it and said, when you get your homework done, come here and do colored chalk paintings for Mrs. McEldowney. So I did. I did colored chalk paintings for Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter when I got my homework done. And by the time I was eight, when I rode my bicycle through the streets of Vanceburg, they would say, there goes the little toll boy. He's an artist. I gave my first art exhibit on the courthouse lawn as a 14-year-old boy. And they came down from the mountains and bought my pictures and I saved the money to go away to school. When I was 15, when I was 15, I went to, to summer camp. I, I was 15. I, I, I wasn't looking for girls. I should have been looking for girls as a 15-year-old, but I'd grown up an only boy with three sisters, and I was pretty sure girls were a mistake. 
true. So I wasn't looking for girls, but when I stepped off that bus, uh, I immediately was looking into the green eyes of the most beautiful human I'd ever seen. Her hair was dark and fell to the middle of her back, and her skin was smooth and tan and flawless, and I just wanted to walk up to her and say, I love you. And uh, I knew if I did, she would say something back to me like, well, shrivel up and die. And so, so I didn't say anything. I just, I was very shy. Uh, guys, I was unathletic. I could not throw, catch, or hit anything. So I just carried a sketch pad, did drawings of the ancient trees in that beautiful state park where we had youth camp in those days. And sometimes I would look over the top of my sketch pad as I was drawing, and I would see her go by in the distance. And I never meant for it to happen, but day by day I fell in love. And by the end of the week, uh, you know how it is at camp, you know, they always give the award for Mr. Youth Camp and Miss Youth Camp. Mr. Youth Camp, that's always the guy with the most muscles who hits the most home runs. And then Miss Camp, that's to the most, Miss Youth Camp, that's the most beautiful and the most popular. Well, she was Miss Youth Camp, just like I figured, and I was not Mr. Youth Camp, just like I knew. And uh, so uh, I didn't go up to congratulate her, but everyone else did. There were a couple hundred kids there, and they were all going up and congratulating her and him. And I stood in the back. I don't know that I had any real sense of destiny as a 15-year-old, but I just didn't want to leave. It was raining outside, I remember, and I stood at the door, leaning inside to catch one last glimpse of her. And they were saying, Mitchell, the bus is leaving. And I needed to go, but I needed to stay. And while I was standing there, torn between leaving and staying, she left where she was and came right to where I was, just like Miss Piggy would come to Kermit the Frog. And suddenly, there she's standing in front of me, and she said, would you like for me to put my address in your sketch pad? Yeah. Yeah. So... I, 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 I said something that she interpreted as meaning yes. I think it was the first time I'd ever spoke in tongues. <laughs> but, but thankfully, she had grown up in a Pentecostal home, and she was able to interpret. <laughs> and so she wrote her address in the back of my, my sketch pad, and she turned to walk away. And as she did, as she did, I needed to stop her. So, so I said, I said, hey. It was more of a kind, it was a kind of a cross between Clint Eastwood and, and Tom Cruise. <laughs> you know, it was, well, I don't have it. <laughs> I never did have it, but I got her stopped and she turned around. And the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I didn't have anything. My parents didn't have any money. I was not famous. I was from Vanceburg, doggone Kentucky. I mean, we were at the end of the end. Actually, you could ask anybody in Vanceburg where the Toll family lives. They say Slate Holler, the last house up. I didn't have anything to offer but a dream. And when she stopped and looked back at me, I said, I know, I know that you think I'm a boy from Eastern Kentucky that'll never amount to anything, but someday I'll be a great artist. And they'll come from around the world and pay thousands of dollars for my pictures. And she said, well, let's get married then. And so we did. It's that girl, and it's 50 years this year. Sometimes it's a long way between the dream and the reality. I went away to the Art Academy of Cincinnati. I became an artist for the United States Army. We settled in a town called Berea, Kentucky, and there we opened the Mitchell Toll Studio and Gallery. And for the next 35 years, we entertained guests from over 80 nations at our gallery there. And sometimes they would come and pay as much for one of my paintings as you would have to pay today for a brand new Mercedes Benz. <laughs> 